Buenos dias, hermanos y hermanas. All right, so today we're going to talk about a video here that I found when I did a search for Revelation 20, uploaded yesterday, called The Magnificent Millennial Kingdom, Part 3. All right, by Brandon Bramlett. Now let's watch this with an open mind and I don't know where I'm going with this, but we're just going to uh, listen and, and then go from there. I think this is extra interesting. Different than the ones I've shared before. Let's pick up where we left off looking at pretty much verses 5 6. Um, we did talk about how verses 4 through 6 generally talk about uh, the death of the believer and how his or her soul goes on to be with the Lord in heaven during this time right now. But we didn't talk much about what the first resurrection means, which John mentions here. And I think it'd be good to untangle that a little bit because we can get kind of mystified and confused about what John means here. We also didn't cover much in verse 6 where John talks about the second death. And so I kind of want to um, unravel that as well. It'll be pretty brief because we don't have much to go here and we're not going to jump into verses 7 through 10, which is the conclusion of this passage, until next time. But as always, let's begin our exposition by hearing and reading the word of the Lord. And we'll begin in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 down to verse 10. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil. All right, so all right, the first problem, obviously, here is that he's quoting from a corrupt Bible. You see these words here? These are from God. All right, it's the King James Bible. It's from God. It's directly from God. It's the words of God. Just as Moses, just as the, just as God gave Moses his word directly, so also does God give us <clears throat> his word directly. Okay. Now, when you're quoting from a corrupt Bible version, those are the words of men. So that's a big problem. And, you know, you've heard me say this over and over. The key to understanding is faith. It's always been about faith. All right. And there's no way you can, anybody can honestly read a corrupt Bible and believe these are the words of God. No way. So anyways, that's problem number one. So he's going to read Revelation 20. And why he stops at, at verse 10 is beyond beyond me. I don't understand why people do this. Because verse 11 is the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just like what we read or what we read in Matthew 24 verse 30. Alright, so let's let's go there real quickly and draw. You know, it's important to know these things, to be able to connect these dots so we can understand what we're reading. All right, in verse 30 it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. There was found no place for them. So this is really the transformation, if you will, from the old earth to the new earth. The old heaven and the new heaven. Alright. Um, I mean, that's real simple. But, you know, why would you leave this out? Because we're putting our hope into everlasting life. A better world. Being delivered out of this world into a perfect world. 
All right. Okay. Devil and Satan. Oh, let's, and bound let's him for a thousand years. Let's fast forward a little bit here. Let's see where he's at. And the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and day and night. So we're looking once to be pretty clear. Um, and ever. So we're looking once again at this magnificent millennial kingdom which John portrays for us here and we have already defined several things that seem to be pretty clear um, as we've looked at this passage. One is is that this thousand year period is referring to the church age which is right now not that it will last for only a thousand years, only a literal millennium, but that this phrase thousand years is symbolic for a long but definite period of time. And in studying this further, I think that perhaps one of the only reasons that he uses this phrase thousand years to describe our current redemptive era is actually for the sake of contrast. You know, there's a lot of contrast in the book of Revelation. You know, it talks about the believer's reward in heaven and the unbeliever's torment in hell. It talks about the establishment of the heavenly city of Mount Zion and the fall of the worldly city of Babylon. Okay, all right, so that's that's not bad. But here, just to, uh, to support his point here, the thousand years is a symbolic, if you will, uh, a representative number indicating a long period of time just like what we read in Psalm 50 verse 10 where it says every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills so to, to make this literal is to say well only a thousand and there's other there's more than a thousand hills so those cattle don't belong to the Lord no 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 come on man you just use a little bit of common sense here all right so you got a lot of these uh, contrast and comparisons in the book of Revelation and you do in regards to time as well you see now, like at verse 7, for example, as well as verse 3, when it talks about Satan's release, it doesn't even say it's going to be for 10 years. It just says a little while, just a short, brief period of time. And basically what John is trying to do for us by using this phrase, thousand years, is he's saying, look, Satan's brief release at the end of the age cannot even compare to the length of our current church age. It's going to be so short. It's going to be so brief. You know, it's as though the church reigns in heaven and on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. And just maybe to uh, illustrate here, it's like Satan gets his grab for power for 60 seconds. Even though he didn't say 60 seconds. He does say just a little while. And so that's just a theory for you as to why uh, the thousand years is even referred to here. Because it is interesting to think about. I mean, this is the only passage in the entire Bible that talks about a thousand years. Revelation 20, that's the only one. Which also leads me to believe this is not talking about a literal earthly kingdom that Christ sets up when he comes back. I mean, if it was that important in Scripture, I think there'd be more than one text about it. Yeah, that's a great point. It's unbelievable how many people teach this idea that Jesus comes back and reigns for a thousand years after his return <clears throat> when it's not supported in the Bible anywhere at all so real quickly let's go to Luke chapter 1 verse 33 it says and he shall reign talking about Jesus he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end it's not a thousand years, it's an everlasting kingdom. All right, so that's a pretty good point by this fellow. So, uh, we said before that Revelation 20 is basically a recap 
of everything in Revelation that's gone before. You know, we said before that the book of Revelation is a lot like uh, different trailers coming out for an upcoming movie. You know, the first trailer doesn't have a lot of details about the plot or the characters. It's just to introduce the movie. You know, the second trailer that comes out for the movie, you know, like two months later, it's a little more intriguing, a little more interesting. You know a little bit more about the movie. More characters are shown, more of the plot line is shown. And then a week before the movie plays in theaters, that's the director's final hook. They put elements in there that really get you and you see more about the movie. It's the exact same movie, but it's being shown in different clips progressively. And that's the way Revelation is structured. It's the same story. It's the same, you know, four or five themes being recycled. But each time we turn in Revelation, we're seeing a little bit more. We're seeing um, the same events replayed for us, but with more color and more detail as we go along. But as much as this is... All right, so that's a great point. And that's that's what I've been trying to share, uh, is that what I call it is different pictures. Now we're being shown different pictures of the same thing. We're looking at the same thing from different angles all throughout the Bible. The analogy that he uses is trailers, movie trailers, which is interesting. But it's it's a good point. It's a good analogy. Because... For example, yesterday I did the video on the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. This is not this is not like um, part one, part two, part three, if you will. This is essentially looking at the same thing in three different ways. All right, from three different viewing points, if you will, of three different trailers, like he says. All right, and it. At the end of the seven seals, there's silence in heaven, just like what we read in the beginning when God rested on the seventh day. At the end of the seven trumpets, the mystery of God is finished. At the end of the seven vials, the seventh vial is uh, released into the air, and then it is done. All right, so it's all the same ending. All right, and that's the end of this world and then the beginning of eternal life in a new heaven and a new earth. All right, it's the same movie. You're just watching different trailers, like he says, right? It's the same thing. You're just looking at it from different ways. And so then fast forward to Revelation 20. It's the same, it's the same movie. It's just another trailer. And so I think that's a great analogy. All right, and at the end of this trailer, we see that fire comes down from God and devours them all, talking about unsaved people, all right, including Satan and the false prophet and the beast and all that. It's all thrown in the lake of fire. It's over. It's finished. It is done. All right, it's the same thing. It's the same moment in time. It's not three different judgments of God or three different ends of the world plus another end of the world here no use a little common sense man this is a recap of everything that's gone before we should note tonight that from just a, from preaching to you from a manuscript but there's just times where a chart just does things that my words cannot so here's an outline for you and Cody you might zoom out the camera so that our live streamers can see all this too. All right, Here's so, basically an outline. Of so I'm not big on charts. You you probably seen me put together a chart and giggled, rightly so. And I you know I've shown you you know, like uh, Robert Breaker's charts and all these other these ridiculous ridiculous men putting together these ridiculous confusing charts that are not scripture that are not uh, that do not square up with the Bible all right and it's not complicated man this isn't rocket science 
But there's a lot of preachers out there taking advantage of people that don't read their Bible. You come up with a fancy, confusing chart, you're going to hook them because they ain't, well, I don't know what the heck that is, but apparently he knows, so I'm going to listen to him. Right? No, you can know. It, the Word of God has been written amazingly that even the dumbest of dummies like me can understand what it's saying. Let's look at his chart. Though. Revelation 20 that we're looking at on through the end of the book of Revelation, if you can see it up there. So Revelation... See, I, I kind of like this chart. You don't have all the fancy BS. It's, I mean... I could, maybe I could nitpick and say, well, you got Revelation. This is only about Revelation 20, 21, 22. That's fine. But this is... You could square this up with the whole entire Bible. Right? Because this final judgment is the end of the world. It's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Right? And we are lifted up in the air. When, he, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up into the air to meet the Lord in the air. And our enemy is gathered at our feet. And fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. Genesis 3 verse 15 the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus is going to stomp on the foot, or I'm, he's going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever and ever. Fire is going to come down from God out of heaven and devour them all. In Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. All right, Revelation 3, verse 9. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. All right, it's prophesied from, Gen from Genesis to Revelation this same thing over and over and over all throughout the Bible Jesus has ascended to heaven with the promise to return and when he returns first the dead in Christ shall rise then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and so all evil is destroyed and then the city of God the heavenly Jerusalem will be set back down on the earth, a new earth with the new heaven. Okay, so it's pretty simple stuff, man. And so I like this chart. I do. It's simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. There's no reason to complicate the prophecy in the Bible regarding the end time. 20 verses 1 through 6, that talks about this current church age, the millennium, this thousand years uh, that is symbolic for a long but definite period of time. John tells us, after this church age is over, after this so-called thousand years has ended, Satan will be released for a little while. That's Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. And it's talking about the end of the age release when Satan is no longer restrained and he goes to gather all unbelieving nations of the world to battle against the church. It's when he pumps Babylon how to crush the church underneath its feet. He launched, you know, he's preparing the battle of Armageddon and such. And then immediately after this brief release of Satan is the final judgment. Christ comes back. He returns bodily and visibly. He crushes the devil. He Take away from him his brief grasp of power and his uh, swift enjoyment of authority. And at that time, that's pretty much when all is said and done. Um, we'll be given new bodies at that time. People will uh, come out of their graves, stand before the Lord Jesus in the bodies they were given. Christ will judge unbelievers. And then after his judgment is rendered, after Satan is defeated and all that, 
then we'll enter into the eternal state. And that's what Revelation 21 and 22 is all about, which I'm excited to get into because um, it's all about heaven. It's heaven from here on out, basically, in those last two chapters. But let's zoom into this a little bit to see how this outline of the millennial passage is really the outline of the book of Revelation. Okay. So, that's kind of what we talked about. we got the millennium, which is right now, the release of Satan, which is still to come, and the final judgment. <laughs> let's get look a little closer here. I hope y'all can see all this. So, all right. So this is fine. I, you know, I, I don't want to nitpick too much, but maybe you're confusing a little bit. To me, it seems like you you kept it real simple, and now you're gonna muddy the waters a little bit. All right. So let me try to attempt, make an attempt to make this real simple. I'm going to run down Revelation 20, okay? And perhaps you've heard me do this before, but it's so simple, so easy to see. If you haven't, I hope this will help you, okay? And I'm not going to stop at verse 10. If you stop at verse 10, then there's that cloud of confusion regarding five simple verses. So it's my very strong opinion. When you teach Revelation 20, just go over every single verse. It doesn't even take five minutes to read it, so let's go over it. Starting at verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So this is important to understand. Uh, when we read Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse in the book of Revelation, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. All right, so everything that we're reading in the book of Revelation is a vision that an angel has shown to John and now John is trying to relay what he has seen to us. All right, and all of this is done by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of God. So that's important because here at the very first verse of Revelation 20, it says, And I, John, saw an angel, that he's seeing another vision. All right, so it's like a, if you want to look at it as another movie trailer, that's fine. But this is a vision being shown to John, and now John is describing for us what he's seeing. All right, and anybody that says Revelation 19 continues on into Revelation 20 is ignorant. All right, that could be a lot harsher than that, but they are ignorant. They don't have any understanding whatsoever, and <laughs> it, it drives me nuts. Let's just put it that way. But this is real simple, fellas, real simple. This is a vision given to John by an angel that comes down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So why is he bound for a thousand years? Well, it's pretty simple. All right, so you go back to the Old Testament and you learn about the promises given to Abraham. All right, and so Abraham is promised to, to be a great nation. And the children of Israel are the children of God. Outside of this nation, they are the it, it, the kingdom of God is only inside that nation outside of that kingdom of God or that nation of God is nations deceived by Satan all right so the this promise that God made to Abraham is a big deal all right because of what is the result of his promise and that is the ultimately the return of our Lord Jesus Christ and the destruction of this world and the 
perfect world that is to come, right? So we want delivered out of this wicked world, just as God helped Moses lead his people out of Egypt, so will Jesus Christ lead us out of this wicked world. Now, think about this. In Exodus 19, God says to Moses, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Outside of this nation were nations deceived. All right, so here comes Jesus Christ, and he says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. All right, so now the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now there are no nations in which the Satan has the ability to deceive because the kingdom of God is available in every corner of the world. All right, so right now we that are born of God exist all throughout the world. And so this is what it means when Satan is bound for a thousand years. He's bound during this time because the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whereas again, before the kingdom of God was just within the nation of Israel all right all right but ye are a chosen this is first Peter chapter 2 ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God which had obtained mercy but which had not obtained mercy excuse me but now have obtained mercy. So the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, and that's important to understand. It's not complicated. If you understand the Bible, this should make perfect sense for you. Now, and let's see, let's, where am I at? Verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Well, why is he loosed for a little season? Well, it's good. we're going to get into that just a little bit more, but that's because it's the end of the world. All right, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for a witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the bees, neither his image, neither received his mark in the forehand or forehead. All right, so let's, uh, let's, let's take a look at something here. I want to go back. All right, I want to go back. and let's do it this way all right so and i saw thrones and they that sat upon them now you just saw where i quoted in first peter chapter 2 ye are a royal priesthood right in revelation chapter 1 he has made us kings and priests unto god and his father See, we are royalty. We have heavenly thrones. We don't have earthly thrones. The earthly thrones are for earthly people. Heavenly thrones are for heavenly people. And we that are born of God, we are heavenly people. This world is not ours, right? We are strangers in a strange land. All right. And I saw thrones... And they that and they sat upon them, and they uh, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Okay, so we are the ones that sit on thrones. We are kings and priests unto God. All right, and judgment is already given to us that are born of God. The judgment of God has already been established forever for us. 
that it can never change. Once God gives us eternal life, that never changes. In John chapter 11, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And so, just from a common sense point of view, if you have eternal life, that's that can never change that God's already established us we are sealed sanctified secured saved forever that'll never change Ju the judgment of God has already been made for us and that judgment is eternal life and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them right now we are saved sealed secured sanctified forever that can never ever change and then I saw thrones I'm sorry and I saw souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the Word of God which had not worshiped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years so this is all going on during this thousand years and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years now this really burns my butt when people try to say this is after the resurrection. It's not after the resurrection. The, and the Bible's very clear about that. The scripture here in Revelation 20 is very clear about that. This is, and you don't look. There are not people walking around with their heads cut off for a thousand years. It's not what this is saying at all. But that's the impression that a lot of people are leaving. And it, I mean, if you say Jesus comes back in the clouds of heaven, and then the, the souls of them that were beheaded are living and reigning with Christ during this thousand years after his return, well, if they were beheaded, that means they're walking around without a head. I mean,. Look, they don't talk a lot about it because they don't know anything about it. And all they're doing is taking advantage of people that don't read the Bible. And it doesn't make any sense, this idea that this happens after Jesus returns. It's idiotic. I mean, either you have to say these guys are walking around without a head, or after Jesus comes, they're going to get their head chopped off. Either way, it doesn't make any sense. And... Again, this is right now. This is happening right now. Right now, we live and reign with Christ right now. All right? Right now, we are living and reigning with Christ during this time period. It's a unique time period. It's unlike the time period before baby Jesus was born, and it's unlike the time period after Jesus returns in the clouds of heaven. That's why it's mentioned or labeled as a thousand years. All right, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. That at the end of the thousand years is the end of the world. This is the first resurrection. Now let me read that again. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Now the, the really, this should be pretty simple. If you think about it, who's the first resurrection? Is it you? Oh, that's what you think, huh? You think you're the first resurrection? Did Well, did you have your head chopped off? No. Okay. So you're not the first resurrection. All right, so John had his head cut off. Is he the first resurrection? No. No, he's not. Go to John chapter 3. All right, John chapter 3, Jesus says, No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So only Jesus has ascended to heaven. Was Jesus resurrected? Yes, he was. 
Was John resurrected? No, he wasn't. Well, John had his head cut off. Why wasn't John res the res first resurrection? It's because he's not God Almighty. He's not God manifest in the flesh. He is not the perfect offering to God for sins. It's Jesus. Jesus says unto her, I am the resurrection. Revelation 20 says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. So you're going to say Jesus still is the first resurrection? Then who was? And this kind of burns my butt a little bit too because you're ignoring what, everything that Jesus has done by saying that no, Jesus isn't the first resurrection. Headless zombies are the first resurrection. But no. No, 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 no. Jesus is the resurrection. The Bible is crystal clear about that. Crystal clear about that. Let's go back here. In 1 Corinthians 15, but every man in his own order, Christ the first roots. Right? Christ the first root. We better go back up here, hadn't we? Let's go in. Yeah, let's I don't know where to start here. If the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. See the dead do rise. And of course, you know, we can go to Daniel chapter 2. Or Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right? For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. So it's very important that Christ is resurrected and he has ascended to heaven. That's very, very important. The fact is he's the first resurrection. That's very, very important. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. It's crystal clear. Jesus is the first resurrection. You're out of your cotton pick in mind to suggest otherwise. You're not a Christian. You're teaching some other foreign religion. Some earthly religion taking advantage of people that don't read their Bible. It's disgusting. But then again, that's exactly what Jesus said would happen at the end times when Jesus is asked about the end of the world. And when he's asked about the sign of thy coming of the end of the world, the very first thing Jesus says is, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I, Jesus, am Christ, and shall deceive many. And that's exactly what we've got going on in the world today. Worse than ever before in the history of mankind. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. It really is. All right, so where was I at? But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. <clears throat> Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So Christ is the first resurrection. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. See, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then comes the end, right? Every man in his own order, Christ the first roost, that's word, they that are Christ that is coming. And then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. 
the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. All right, make no mistake about it. Jesus is the first resurrection. You, I don't know how you can even look anybody square in the eyes and say something contrary to that. Really. Uh, I mean, it makes me, it makes me a little bit angry because there are so many people that have absolutely no understanding whatsoever teaching things that they ought not to teach. All right. So, anyways, this should be crystal clear. Jesus is the first resurrection. We are partakers of his resurrection. Right? But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die the second death has no power over us that are born of god but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years right and he has made us kings jesus christ has made us kings and priests unto god and his father we are a royal priesthood. We read in Exodus 19 how the children of Israel were a kingdom of priests. We are called to preach the gospel to every creature. We are priests of God and of Christ right now. All right, to teach something else other than that is teaching another religion. All right, teaching a false religion. You are a false teacher. To suggest we are not kings and priests of God right now. And when the thousand years are expired, it's the end of the world. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So think about this. What have we been reading this entire time? Right? When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, we are resurrected. We are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. Right, just like what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. We are lifted up. We are resurrected. All right. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the sun's going to be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And the, all the world, all the earth is going to mourn. Right? I mean, everybody's going to know it. Everybody's going to know it's the end of of the world it's nothing like the left behind movie at all where people are scratching their rear ends wondering where the heck did george go no it's not gonna be like that at all that movie lies and people still teach that movie as though it's the gospel and it's not men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth and the for the powers of heaven shall be shaken People are going to be freaking out, man. All the earth is going to mourn when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. And when he comes in the clouds of heaven, we are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. All right. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed all right for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory Right, it says the same thing right up here in 1 Corinthians 
15. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Right? So when all these things shall happen, and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Right? So this is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. It is the end of the world. All right? And we are, first we are lifted up. So Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We are lifted up to meet the Lord. All right, so all the saved people are lifted up from the dead to the living. All the saved people are lifted up in the air to meet the Lord. All right, so what do you got left on earth? You got nothing but unsaved people left on the earth. All right, so let's go back to before baby Jesus was born when the the nation of Israel was the was the nation of God. Outside of that nation was not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was only inside the nation of God. The kingdom of God was only for those, the children of Israel. All right, And then Jesus comes along and says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Meaning that whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall never die. All right, so... The kingdom of God is available to whosoever lives and believes in Him. All right, so just like in the Old Testament, outside of the kingdom or outside of uh, you know, the kingdom of God, were nations deceived. All right, so now here comes Jesus, and so that He gathers together His people. It's the return, if you will, of the children of Israel. They're gathered from all corners of the earth. This time, they're not put on a, on a you know. Um, they're not uh, gathered into a, a, you know, we're not worldly, right? There's not a, you know, we're not sent over to the Middle East, if you will. We are gathered up into the air. And we're up in the air to meet the Lord. So everybody on earth, they're all the unsaved people. Right? And so... This is what happens when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. We are lifted up to meet the Lord, and our enemy is gathered together at our feet. All right, so now all the nations on earth, Satan once again has that ability, that power to deceive them, like he did back in the Old Testament. Right, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his pre prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 talks about that, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. There's a lot of unsaved people that are going to be gathered at our feet. All right, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. The beloved city is the heavenly Jerusalem, where we're lifted up in the air, all right, Jerusalem, which is above, all right, it's not the earthly Jerusalem. We are not earthly people. We are heavenly people. We are strangers in a strange land. All right, Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. All right, so the beloved city is above. It's not that filthy one down on the earth. All right. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. All right, so they're, ga they're gathering at our feet. Remember what we read in Revelation 3, verse 9? Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee right so they are gathered at our feet when we're up in the air God's gonna make them to know that he loves us and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them alright and then let's go to Genesis chapter 3 I mean this is the same thing being taught all throughout the Bible. 
And I will, the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. See, we are up in the air, and the Lord Jesus Christ stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, devouring all evil forever. Then shall be brought to pass the thing that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. All right, same thing here. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours all the unsaved people. All right, I mean, come on, man. This stuff is so obvious, and um, it drives me nuts that people don't understand it. And it's so simple because it's the same thing that's being taught all throughout the Bible. Okay, so in verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast in a lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, so we read about this in chapter 19, how the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. All right, and all this verse is saying is that the devil, the devil is throwing, been, the devil is thrown into the same place that we just read about the beast and the false prophet being thrown into. All right, think of trailer one as chapter 19. All right, all right, in that first trailer movie that we saw, in the first trailer, we saw the beast and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. Well, now here in the second trailer, we see the devil being thrown into the lake of fire. It's nothing, it's not complicated, man. What do you think? There's an end of the world and a judgment of God and all this and then, what, a thousand years and then another end of the world? Well, no, 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 no. If that were the case, then the first end of the world wasn't the end of the world. You're selling something that's not in the Bible, man. It makes great movies. I get it. People eat that stuff up, but it's not the Word of God. And right here in verse 11, this is parallel to what we were reading in Matthew 24 as well. Right? Because here we see the sun being dark and the moon shall not give her light and stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken whose, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there's found no place for them. This is prophesied all throughout the Bible in, in the book Isaiah and the book of Joel and so on and so forth. All in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, all throughout the Bible. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the sun's going to be dark, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. This is the end of the world. Okay, and this is the great white throne. That's Jesus. It's not you. Sorry, buddy. Sorry about your luck. It's not going to be you. It's going to be Jesus. All right, him. He's going to be the one that's sitting on the great white throne because he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. All right. And so this, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open, and another book was open, and which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. All right, and they're going to be found guilty because they did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell were delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's the end of the world, man. It's the second death. All right, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. All right, but we are priests and kings of God. Or, uh, I'm sorry, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this, we don't have to worry about. But those of us that are born of God, we don't have to worry about the second death. All right, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. All right. Judgment has already been given to us, and that is eternal life. But for these people that are not saved, the judgment is really bad. Really, really bad. And they're thrown into the death, or they're thrown into the lake of fire. Right? Death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire. It's, it's going to be done away with forever. I right, see, so think about all the unsaved people out there. It's, it, it's, it seems impossible to reach them, but... This is our opportunity to try to reach them, to plant the seeds of truth, and to let them know that there is somebody that can deliver us out of this wicked world. You see so many people recognizing the evils of this world, not realizing that there is a deliverer 
that can deliver us out of this wicked world. And it's what we all need, right? We all need a Savior. All right, we all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us. We all need a Savior. Okay, and so whoever and whosoever was found was not found, excuse me, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right, so when this happens, it's the end. All right, there, then there will be silence in heaven, right? And the mystery of God is finished, all right? And this is when the angels throw up the seventh vial into the air, and it is done, right? And, of course, we go to Revelation 21, and it talks about a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. That's what we're putting our hope into. And not a period of time, but a, a world of everlasting life. Alright? So I hope that was simple enough. I really do. And, uh, you know, i got to say this. It's, this is a pretty good job by this fellow here, Brandon Bramlett. Obviously, i got a big issue with him not. Uh, you know quote using the King James Bible all right because what happens is you you lose faith when you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands and when you lose faith you lose understanding and so on and so forth but anyway um, compared to everybody else that I've shared this guy does a really good job all right so please leave a comment have a great day adios